tell us a bit about your family history? My grandfather had one original wife, and then he had a girlfriend, and then he um, married Sung Ching Ling, who is the well-known wife of his uh, worldwide. However, my grandmother was the only wife that had any children. And she had one son, which is my father, and two daughters. And the two daughters don't have any descendants left. Uh, so all the descendants of my grandfather are, are from my father. And my father had two wives. His first wife had um, two sons and two daughters. And then his, my mother is the only second wife that he recognizes. And I'm uh, the only child between them. Uh, my um, grandfather uh, divorced my grandmother in order to marry Tsung Ching Ling. And according to my father, um, my grandmother was Ill illiterate. And so my grandfather asked my grandmother to put an X on this document because it was for the country's benefit. So uh, my grandmother was divorced. But of course, in the old days, they were match made anyway. So it wasn't a marriage of love. And my grandmother accepted that. And my um, grandfather's elder brother, uh, when, who educated my grandfather, took care of her. And she lived with the uh, elder brother's family for the rest of her life. And not, I'm sorry, not for the rest of her life, but uh, until they died. And they took care of her, and my father then took care of her after my grandfather died. So she was always well taken care of. It was just that it isn't the kind of marriage that people expect now. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, on paper, she was no longer the wife of Sun Yat, Dr. Sun Yat Sun, but was she still considered wife number one? Yes, yes. And uh, according to uh, Taiwan history, they still recognize her as the official wife. Um, <laughs> what kind of business was your father involved in? Was he in politics or was he in the military? He was in politics. He um, uh, served uh, the uh, uh, Kuomintang, the KMT, uh, almost all his life. He respected my grandfather a great deal. And he, uh, when my grandfather died in 1925, uh, the KMT, of course, then took care of my father, I mean, promoted my father because my grandfather w had such a huge following. So with the Chinese mentality of, uh, like, emperor mentality is all I can say, um, the inheritance of the son, uh, the, the uh, respect and, and uh, uh, adulation of some sort was passed on to the son. And my father was in politics all his life. He uh, various times served in many, many, in many capacities, uh, starting when he was very young as the mayor of Guangzhou, and uh, well, went on at various times to be like the um, head of the railroads, uh, uh, head of all, all kinds of ministries. And then he was. Um, the uh, president of uh, the legislative yuan for the longest time. And he was also the president of the executive yuan, which is equivalent to the premier. And he also ran for vice president in, after the war. Um, I remember as a child uh, this campaign in Nanjing, uh, but I don't remember exactly what year. I think it was 19. 47 or something. Did he talk about the war years a lot? Um, do you know what his feelings were like as far as the communist victory in 1949? Actually, uh, I really don't know exactly because we didn't have that many conversations. I mean, you know, when I was uh, little, um, of course, I was too young to carry on conversations of this sort, of this kind of magnitude. And then when I grew up, uh, he wasn't with me. He was, you know, in the States, and my mom and I were in Hong Kong. So um, 
And then uh, when he went back to Taiwan, I was married by then, so I wasn't living with him, and I only saw him occasionally, so we didn't really have these very long, in-depth conversations. We were talking about um, your mother's experiences yesterday. Can you tell us a, a bit about that as far as leaving China and having this idea that things will blow over and sh she'd be able to return quite quickly? Yeah. Well, um, China has always had always been at war, and my mom was born in a, of an age where there were always um, turmoil and uns unsettlement, and people were always refugees running around from one part of China to another, or one city to another, or from the north to the south, or vice versa. So it was a, a sort of just a nature that uh, people, Chinese people, did not have a safe, content, secure way of life. And so uh, when, and of course, my mom lived through the Japanese um, occupation and the Japanese um, uh, war uh, with China, and so, you know, uh, people just sort of accepted, and the most valuable thing um, to uh, the people is land. Land was always there. People come and people go. Regimes come and regimes go. People ran away and were refugees. But if you own the property and you own the land, you own the houses, that belonged to you. It didn't matter who came and who went. So my mom um, was very, uh, was a very unusual woman. She was, first of all, she was like the toast of Shanghai. She was gorgeous. She was, everybody knew how beautiful she was. And my, um, my father at one time uh, offered his resignation to the uh, KMT government uh, in defense of my mother because the government was accusing her of something that was, wasn't true. And he said that if they didn't, uh, you know, release her, and uh, he was going to resign. And so uh, she was really uh, a well-known beauty. And uh, uh, anyway, she was in, on top of being gorgeous, she was also very clever. So she made a, a great deal of money, invested in a great deal of property, properties in Shanghai. And so to her, that was her worth. She was always going to have that. And uh, so when the communists uh, was having these um, uh, problems with the uh, nationalists and there was uh, you know, potential overthrow of the nationalists and the communists were going to take over one part of the country or another. And this had been going on since World War II because when World War II happened, everybody was focused on fighting the Japanese. But then after 1945, when war with VJ Day happened, uh, then the communists and nationalists started really going at it and they started losing places and prop uh, locations and. Uh, and this war really went into earnest, the, uh, 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 you know, uh, internally. So then uh, my uh, dad sort of uh, told my mom, don't worry about it, you know, because she had all this property, in, uh, all these properties in Shanghai. So my mom thought, well, people come and people go, you know, her properties will always be there. So just on the safe side, she took some, whatever deed she had because in those days, a lot of the property didn't even have deeds. But she, uh, and times were kind of a mess, you know, things were going. Anyway, she did get the deeds of some of the property that, you know, she went ahead and got. And she took those deeds with her. And uh, later on, she told me, she figured, you know, people come and people go and uh, regimes come. Uh, this will last maybe a few years, you know. Uh, three, four years, five years, and she'll be back, and her deeds were with her, and that was fine. Well, she didn't go back to China, and I didn't think we were ever going to go back to China because I remember growing up and thinking we'll never see China. I, I didn't remember much of China because I was a young kid, but still, um, I remember my uncles, my aunts, everybody talking and missing Shanghai so much, you know, because when we first went to Taiwan, uh, uh, well, we came, we came to Hong Kong first, 
and then I went to Taiwan to stay with my uncles and went to school there and they used to complain it was so backward it was so provincial it was I mean nothing compared to Shanghai and I can remember they always complained so I didn't think we were ever ever going back to China ever, we would ever see China or, again because uh, you know the communists just wasn't something that you would go back to and and that was like the bamboo curtains came down that was the end and so I told my mom and she was hauling these deeds around and I said oh throw them away burn them up there's no use you know there'll never be any use we're never going to go back there and of course um, 1978 happened and, and came and the US recognized China and that was the first time once the US recognized established official uh, diplomatic relations that was the first time I felt confident that I could go to China because in the old days you didn't dare you could always go to China but nobody dared go because that was the one place you could go but you're not sure you're going to come out and uh, and uh, there there used to be a saying about poor Chinese you know in in Hong Kong you could uh, you couldn't come in it was very difficult for Chinese to come into Hong Kong, but you could leave any time. It was very difficult, it was very easy for Chinese to go into China, but you couldn't leave, so it was the opposite. However, in Taiwan, it was difficult to go in and it was difficult to go out because you had to have entry permit, which had to be guaranteed by people. Uh, even if you had a KMT passport, which we all had carried, we couldn't go in and out of Taiwan without an entry permit and an exit permit. And to get an entry or an exit, you didn't just go to the police station and get it stamped. You had to have people guarantee that you were, I don't know what they guarantee, that you weren't a communist spy or something. And so it was very difficult for Chinese to travel in the old days. <laughs> I want to follow up on that. There's this climate of fear, really, mm -hmm. of being caught, either if you're in Taiwan or China, and you're trying to get messages or send things to relatives Well, yeah, either place. I mean, yeah. can you explain, we talked about that yesterday, about yeah. the dynamics and how people, you had to be very innocuous in your correspondence. Yeah. And, and, and well, where does Hong Kong fit in all of this? I mean, well, it was, um, Hong Kong was like the entrepot. Um, Hong Kong was the Casablanca of uh, Asia, because the only, and, and all the CIA, all the uh, spy organizations would come to Hong Kong to find out what was happening on the mainland. I mean, uh, this was the, the one place that there were trickles of people coming from the mainland because the border was there and people would either swim and escape or they would have relatives and somehow would you know, come out to Hong Kong. Anyway, there, were, there may be trickles. I don't know exactly how the uh, refugee um, uh, came through to Hong Kong, but that was the place where there was little cracks to this bamboo curtain that had fallen in China that nobody knew what was happening behind it. So people, uh, all the refugees that had poured out of China uh, in 1948, 49, 50 in the early days of communism, all the, all the diaspora, diaspora went off. Either the KMT would all go to Taiwan, uh, and uh, many of the people, business people, would go to the U.S. There were a huge uh, uh, population of Shanghainese that went to New York uh, because they were all wealthy businessmen. And depending on how wealthy, if you were with the government, you went to Taiwan. If you were wealthy, you went to New York, you know. And the rest sort of stayed in Hong Kong. Uh, I mean, the, the not as wealthy, not very uh, political people stayed in Hong Kong because they couldn't afford to go to uh, the states and they didn't feel like they wanted to join the KMT in Taiwan, so they remained in Hong Kong. But they were definitely not going to stay in communist China because they felt they would be um, punished if they stayed there because either they were, they may not be that wealthy, but they were still business people or the capitalists or whatever. So uh, these people then 
had many relatives who were stuck, and it was by chance, you know, depending on where you were at the time, uh, whether you got shipped out of the country or whether you got stuck behind under communism. So there were many, many families. I mean, almost everybody had family or husbands and wives, because I met people in Taiwan whose wives were left in China and children, and they went with the government to Taiwan, and, and that was the end of their um, marriage, you know. So then they would take another wife in Taiwan after many years, thinking they're never going to see their wives again or something, maybe eight, ten years later. But anyway, these kind of stories you used to hear all the time. So people in uh, uh, abroad, as they uh, became established, they wanted to help their families in China, but they couldn't communicate from Taiwan or the U.S. So they had to go through Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, there would be relatives or friends of these people would then send the money to China, to the relatives. And the communist government knew that this money was coming from abroad, but they didn't stop it because this was their way of getting a great deal of foreign currency, uh, foreign support, because all this money was coming in from relatives of families in, in China. So they used that. They didn't stop it. Um, and, and, uh, but then when they were writing letters to each other, they had to be very careful because the people in China was ver very careful what they wrote because anything they wrote could be used as evidence against them when there were all these programs going on, you know, all of a sudden all anti rightists anti-this, anti-that. So they were always very afraid what they might write uh, to their families abroad. And then the families abroad would be very afraid what they would write to their relatives in China because whatever the letters they wrote might indicate they're in the U.S. or in Taiwan, which, be, which would be very bad. So they would write these innocuous letters to each other that you know, didn't say anything because they were afraid to uh, even give a hint of where they were. Uh, and it was very sad you know, because here's one country and all Chinese people, and they, you know, as one, a, a Chinese friend of mine said to me, look at all the statues in China. There isn't one statue that's erected because this man was brave enough to fight out, fight a foreign invader. All the statues they have erected in China are heroes of people who have killed other Chinese.